Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. We are delighted to have you with us today. This reading is brought to you by Strong Women's Strange Worlds, which is a group of authors supporting other authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and other underrepresented gender identity authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror through events like our bi-monthly virtual quick read sessions. You can find out more about Strong Women's Strange Worlds in the handout that will be linked in the chat and by visiting our website. A link to that will also be added to the chat in a moment. I would also like to take a moment to thank those who have made a tip jar donation to help us cover some of our costs, which sadly seem to keep rising. So thank you. We appreciate you so much. I am your host today, Ann Nidum. You can find out more about me in the provided handout as well as I'm one of the uh, organizers of this. I would like to note before we go any farther that recording of this session by the audience is not allowed. And in fact, recording of electronic communications, including Zoom meetings and webinars without permission is illegal. All right, today we will be featuring six authors. Lindsay Duncan, Lex Beckett, Yvette Tan, Shamiz Patel Papathanasu, Julie, Julie E. Cherneda, and J.R. Dawson. Each author, as usual, will have eight minutes to read. Our first reader is Lindsay Duncan. Lindsay Duncan is a chef and pastry chef, professional Celtic heart performer, and lifelong writer, and uh, her short fiction and poetry has appeared in numerous speculative fiction publications. Her science fiction novel, Scylla and Charybdis, is available from Grimbold Books. She feels that music and language are inextricably linked. She lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. Lindsay, take it away. Um, this scene from uh, Scylla and Charybdis is the day after Aenea's first conversation with Gideon. Uh, the habitats of the preserve dominated one of the largest open spaces on the station. Lush jungle crowded against open plain. Gray cliffs seemed to disappear into an invisible stratosphere above. Cloudy plastic alloy divided the ecosystems. The numerous animal species that populated the preserve had once run wild, and here had been their own small world. Anea found Arethia by a reptile habitat. A six-limbed reptile from Perica eyed them glumly from the other side of the barrier. Anea was surprised to see Penelope clinging to Arethia's shoulders. The curl's tail was tucked around her human's arm. She purred happily when she saw Anea pulling her owner's hair to get her attention. The genetically engineered beasts were the only pets on the station. Every other animal was a preserved specimen or food. Arethia swatted at the paws. Penelope, would you? She turned, beaming when she saw the reason for the creature's excitement. Anne, good to see you. What's going on? Anea scratched the curl behind the ears. The creature cooed. Can we talk? If we walk as we do it. Arethia waved for her to follow. Is this about your mystery, ma'am? Even more mysterious than I thought. Anea explained what he had said, keeping her voice low. They moved past habitats, including one that housed earth zebras. Arethia whistled. So, do you think he makes blood sacrifices and worships idols? Ori! Anea protested. The young woman giggled as she palmed them into the computer room, then sobered. All this, and he wants to go home? He seemed very sure. Anea sat in the room's other chair as Arethia flipped out her kit. Like most programmers, she backed up the vocal commands with a spatial relay cube. Unlike most, she also had an old-fashioned keyboard. Anea had always found it endearing and a little hypnotic. She enjoyed watching the flurry of Arethia's fingers. How will that go, I wonder? Arethia spoke half to herself. I didn't think we let people do that. We don't. Anea jumped as Penelope hopped over and crawled onto her shoulder, burrowing against her neck. Arethia chewed her lip, anxious. I can't imagine leaving Themyscira and never seeing it again. So how can I help? I need to meet with him again, Anea said, stroking the curl. Penelope rubbed her side against the touch. I know you were joking before. I was, Arethia said, but I can still bypass security for you. Let's check on him first, shall we? Her hands flitted over the keys. She made a worried sound. Anea, they have your friend in for surgery. 
You didn't tell me he was that badly injured. Surgery? What could have happened? Confusion twisted at her. He wasn't. Arethia frowned. Let me tap in. Anea knew she should have protested and couldn't, her mind twitching with scenarios that wouldn't have occurred to her a few days ago. She didn't want to consider them now, and it left her stomach sour. She stroked Penelope and felt the creature's hum through her hand. Curls had been engineered as companion animals, and the pattern of Penelope's breath soothed her, even though she half knew the science. Ori, she said, if this is risky, I don't want you to do it. Arethia paused, swiveling in her chair. Hazel eyes fixed on Anea's face. We've known each other forever, Anne. You've always had a steady head on your shoulders, better than mine. If you want to do something, I trust you. Anea felt a twinge. They had split, almost three years ago, not because of any lack of feeling, but due to a dozen small things that had been fine for friends, but awkward in a couple. She still half-fenced the sense the failing had been hers. The record is blank, Arethia reported. No procedure log. That means, I have no idea what that means. They're not supposed to do that. She flicked a pensive look sideways at Anea. Do you want to feed? Can you do that? No cameras in the chamber, and their links are bound to be off, Arethia said. But some of the other equipment, I can extrapolate, at least with audio. She drew a puffy breath. I haven't had this much of a challenge since I was first in training. Since she had been in training, and since she had astonished instructors two decades older than she, Anea nodded, waiting in tense silence. She realized she was squeezing Penelope when the curl nibbled her hand in protest. Not working, Dr. Braun. The voice that came through the speakers was thin and static-laden. That's impossible, Alaska said. The neural readings are incomprehensible. Arethia made a face. I'm running it through an enhancement program. Not a mistake. Tested and worked on others, Alaska snapped, which made it harder to discern the words. This shouldn't be happening. The facts are as they are, Velasca. The relay evened out as Thalestris's calm tone came through. For whatever reason, his memories are immutable. Arethia mouthed the word memories. Anea bit her lip, remembering part of her conversation with Alestris. Technological advances, she had said, would make it possible for men to join Themyscira in society. Gideon might be the first. As long as he, they, didn't remember where they had come from? He's waking up, someone reported. Anea's body went cold. Was it possible to remove an individual's memories? Who would allow it? The people she knew and looked up to were not capable of such a thing. Not possible, Velasca repeated. I confirmed the doses myself. Velasca, look at the brainwave readings. Cancer on hyperspace, Velasca swore. Oh, come on, tell us, Arethia said, or I'll have to hack the readings. Those are hypermental levels, another doctor said. Thank you, Arethia muttered. Despite the tension pouring through her, Anea had to fight the urge to smile. His shipboard record said nothing about this, Velasca said. Why would they send someone with his gifts out into the middle of nowhere? Does someone suspect? Easy, Velasca, Velestra said. What do we do with him if this doesn't work? Velasca didn't hesitate. We have to. The voices cut out to the accompaniment of Arethia's typing. She jerked her hands back as if she had been burned. Security program was about to find us out, she said, her face pale and strained. Anea sat in silence, fingers clenched into the curl's fur. Penelope chittered, but did not otherwise protest. What would they do with him? And what were they destroying as they did it? Themyscira was a place of harmony, of finding the right path, and it left space for those like her who had yet to find theirs. She had to believe, if Gideon knew what he was talking about, that the doctors were unaware of the truth of his world. Thank you, Ori, Anea said, rising in a rush. She scooped Penelope onto the chair. I have to go before they make a mistake. And Anea had reached the doorway, the sense of the preserves swirling around her, rich and earthy. She turned back to Arethia's strained face. Please stay, Arethia said. Just trust them. It had been a game to her minutes before, but now she looked frightened. Her hands twitched as if she wanted to grab Anea and hold her back, putting her whole body into it. Anea was acutely conscious this was the first important thing Arethia had asked of her in three years. The realization burned, but it had no chance of changing her mind, and that made her feel worse. Not only was she failing Arethia, she couldn't even try. I'm sorry, she said, and spun out the door. <laughs> what an intriguing scene you showed us. That is you. very <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our second reader is Lex Beckett. 
award-winning author A.M. Delamonica's newest novels, Game Changer and Deal Breaker, were released under the name Lex Beckett. They are solar punk adventures that imagine humanity surviving climate change and creating a post-carbon economy. Lex, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I just want to say before I start reading that um, this book was written, and I'm reading it today, on the ancestral and traditional territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians of this land on which I have the good fortune to live and create. Chapter one. <laughs> The surface, West Euro Densification Zone, Metro Paris, May 2101. Cherub Whiting's first real world police raid was nothing like The Sims. She was in a chic Parisian neighborhood with a view of the Eiffel Tower, waiting on a meeting. When Interpol showed up in her pop-in conference room, she had been sending pings to a no-show client for the better part of an hour. Luce, you're late. Luce, it's time for our face-to-face. -face. Where are you? He'd be afraid to skip, wouldn't he? By the time someone's social capital got so bad they merited a face-to-face -face meeting, one involving the horrifying carbon cost of flying a lawyer from Toronto to West Euro, no less, they were desperate to get life back on track. Failure to appear was unheard of. The drag of jet lag had left Ruby mentally fogged. It dawned only slowly that she was obsessing. Can I get a volunteer gig while I wait, Crane? Her electronic sidekick had obviously been expecting the request. A radish pallet across the hall has requested weeding and watering. Crane's crisp voice, transmitted via tiny implanted earbuds, had a British accent. He sounded like he was at her shoulder. Its usual gardener had an emergency. Except task. Ruby's visual implant superimposed the mirage of a yellow arrow onto the floor, mapping the way to a conference room big enough for 12. The pallet of seedlings in question had been abandoned mid-job. Thumb-sized plants with leaves like propellers ruffled in a breeze from the open window. Beyond them, the streets of Paris beckoned. Ruby felt a pang for whoever had been tending the radishes. Run tutorial? I remember how to weed radishes, Crane. Nudging aside a delicate stem with her thumbnail, she isolated one of the undesirables, tugging it from the soil. See? Very good, miss. Where was Luce? If they couldn't convince CloudSight that he could behave pro-socially, he would be remanded to managed care, relocation to the outskirts, mandatory labor on an ecosphere rehab project, topsoil generation, probably, and censored comms. It was a prison sentence in all but name. You can't make him appear, Ruby told herself. Breathe, pull weeds, enjoy the solitude. Heavy boots pounding up the double stairwell Farewell double time filled her with relief. Finally. Crane spoke, momentarily drowning out the elephant stampede. Miss Cherub, call for you. Is it dad? Your father's fine. The call is from your arch nemesis. That's not funny. No, I'll make a note. Gimlet Barnes is not my arch. Clomp, 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 bang. An armored man charged through the door. Ruby pivoted, squaring off to face the threat and brandishing a fistful of weeds. The move was reflexive, triggered by hours logged in game. Plus, maybe the mention of Gimlet. If this had been a game, her implants would have augmented the white-walled meeting room until it was unrecognizable, frosting visuals and sound over mundane reality, porting her into play space. A dungeon, maybe. A space station. Or a canyon in the mythical American Wild West. Instead, the walls lit up with official warnings. Posters scrolled on the plaster, red and black placards. Police line, do not cross. Don't move. A cop? Luce couldn't be a cop, could he? With his social deficits? Official directives crawled the posters. Remain in place. Wait for instructions. Ruby had risen to her toes, prepping for rolling left if he attacked. Heart slamming, she scanned for weapons. Like what, a crossbow, holy water? Two cameras and a pacification bot drifted over her radishes. Stand down, mademoiselle, stand down now. Ruby lowered her fists. Of course this policeman wasn't loose. He was a stranger. Handsome stranger, noted an inner voice. Damn it, stay on task. Complying as ordered. 
He was tall and olive-skinned, with flyaway hair, the color of charcoal, and forbidding features. Sharp nose, steely eyes. A protective vest over the base layer of nanosilk he wore as a primer garment left her to imagine the details of his physique. His bot was armed with a joy buzzer, third-generation taser tech. Dad claimed a good jolt would make you wish you'd die. Interpol must have a warrant, because the building hadn't warned Crane that he was coming. As this thought gelled, a badge resolved on the wall. Interpol, Special Ops, Agent Anselmo Javier. Pronouns, he, him. Cloud site respectability rating, 67%. Agent Javier checked under the old hardwood table, then peered inside a closet filled with folding chairs. I'm going to search the rest of the floor, he said. Wait here, s'il vous plaît. He left Ruby alone with the drones. Feigning calm, she peered beyond the radishes to the street. Zoom views from other cameras let her clock a half dozen meandering residents and tourists. So, tourists, civilians, weren't being diverted away from the scene. Still, there were at least a dozen drones lurking in the shadows. And her mouth went dry. An anonymous, autonomous sniper bristling with trank darts was tucked into a balcony across the street. It had its sights on her. As she clocked it, the nanotech primer on its exterior changed color. It blended in with a building pediment covered in anti-pigeon spikes. As it all but vanished, Ruby felt goosebumps coming up on her arms. A gun, an actual gun. Crane murmured, isn't this how that 1942 simulation started out? That was a game, Ruby said. Still, she let the memory raise a smile. Wild with exhaustion, she had torn through a VR sim of occupied Paris, meeting contacts, passing messages, and setting garlic traps for Vichy vampires. It was the only time in her life she had let life in sensorium swamp her studies, had ignored school and all her surface obligations. She should have been memorizing social infraction case precedents before her next law exam unlocked. Instead, she stayed online for 18 hours, sabotaging trains and stealing bomb plans. The deal breaker had been her so-called arch nemesis. Gimlet Barnes had been brought in by Risto Gaines in a last minute twist to lead a team of German necromancers hunting her resistance cell. Ruby had lost big in their previous battle, a superhero thing. She'd apparently lost perspective too. Once Gimlet was in, there was no chance she'd stop, not even for a better shot at leveling her mashup of careers into a single perma job as a public defender. Thrill of adrenaline, rat-a-tat of machine guns, crossbow-driven stakes, sim blood spraying as buildings collapsed, players and audience tuning in by the tens of thousands. Stone tumbling to drive a pall of dust skyward, thick enough to curtain the moonlight. Howling werewolf choruses, bone-shaking glass of shellfire stripping the air to gunpowder lace sandpaper. But never again, Crane. And I will leave it there. Mm, I'm loving being dropped into these scenes and trying to figure out the world. All right. Our third reader is Yvette Tan. Yvette Tan is one of the Philippines' most celebrated horror writers. Her stories use folk horror as a jumping off point to examine different facets of what it means to be human and monster. Yvette, let's hear what you've got. Hey, thank you. Hello, everyone. So before I read, just to give you an explanation. So Foster's an American, and he's checking out a mail-order bride website called sikihorbrides.com, which is named after the Philippine province Sikihor, but which he first misunderstands as Sikihor, hence the title of the story. So... The name of the website was misleading. That was the first thing Foster realized. The women on the site didn't look like what Foster thought of as whores. Beautiful, all of them, with smooth brown skin and gorgeous eyes framed demurely by a, a curtain of dark lashes and soft, inviting lips. Their headshots, though inexpertly done, looked more like model portfolios than ID pictures. Their full body shots had them in tank tops and mini skirts or hot pants indulging in domestic duties like cooking and cleaning and doing the laundry. It would have been absolutely ridiculous if the girls weren't so hot. The site was written in substandard but passable English 
with the women grouped according to their domestic specialty, cooking, housekeeping, laundry, and so forth. Foster studied their profiles, wondering if he should pick Nora, who loved to clean, or Vilma, who was the top student, who was the top student in her high school English class, or Gloria, who loved the laundry, if only because the statement made him laugh. He was beginning to call the whole thing off, to chalk it up to a silly disconnect in his brain when he happened upon Luli. He didn't know what it was that made her stand out, that drew him to her. Maybe it was the mischievous twinkle in her eyes or the slight upturn of her mouth that made it look like she was neither smiling nor frowning or her sweet, innocent face that made it look like she needed saving. She was perfect. In her full body picture, she was bending down against an open oven caught in the act of bringing out a Thanksgiving turkey. Foster felt his pants tighten. Her shorts were so tiny he could see the lower part of her ass while her low-cut tank top showed off her ample cleavage, which despite the downward angle seemed to defy gravity. The turkey she held in her hands was plump and perfectly brown. Foster could almost see the juices bursting from inside it, its stuffing cooked just right, something to truly give thanks for. Luli listed her talents as cooking and singing and her interests as learning new recipes. Before he knew it, Foster was clicking the marry me button under her picture and entering his credit card number into the processing form. She didn't come cheap, but overall he spent less than what he expected, especially on her travel expenses. He was told that his transaction was a success and that he should be expecting his first shipment in three to six weeks or after the papers were processed, whichever came first. Foster did a double take. Did he just get conned into spending three months worth of salary for a blow-up doll? Or maybe they were going to ship her stuff first, then have her come by play later. Or did they treat the women there so much like stuff that they actually referred to them that way? And what did first shipment mean? Was there a second, a third? Did she have so much stuff that they couldn't fit it on a plane? Foster needed to know, but he didn't want to come off like a fool. In the end, he swallowed his pride and asked Donovan about it. That's right, Donovan said when asked about the packages. It's like some miracle of science. That's why the shipping cost is so low. Foster pressed further. I don't want to spoil it for you, Donovan grinned. Only don't fucking freak out. Oh, and just add water. Foster spent half of the next three weeks in anticipation over Luli's arrival and the other half in jealousy of Donovan and his daily lunches. One Monday, it was a giant pastrami sandwich with cob salad and a peach. Tuesday, it was a greasy, heart-stopping sloppy joe with home fries and homemade applesauce. Wednesday, it was a Caesar chicken sub with oversized homemade chocolate chip cookies. By Thursday, Foster had taken to staying longer in the cafeteria so that he wouldn't have to be tortured by the sight of Donovan munching on his appetizing meals made by his appetizing wife. Week one. The first package came early, 19 days after Foster had clicked marry me. It was long. It was a long, thin cardboard box labeled fragile. At first, he thought that it was from someone else, like his mother maybe, or that it had been sent to him by mistake. But it had his name and his home address on it, as well as the sikihorbrides.com logo, a stylized head wearing a veil, but no name or, or address. He opened the package his hands trembling and in, in anticipation. And then he began to scream. It was a leg, a human leg, a woman's right leg and foot, her toenails clipped short and painted bright red. Foster held it in his hands, not knowing what to do. And then it flexed. Still screaming, he threw it across the room where it hit the edge of his coffee table before falling onto the rug. He backed away, thoughts of murder and going to jail running through his head. He noticed the letter that had fallen out when he opened the package. He remembered Donovan's warning about freaking out, forced himself to stop yelling, and, reach, and to reach, hands still trembling, for the letter. His hands were shaking so much he almost tore the envelope in two, almost destroyed the letter inside. Somehow he managed to get it open. It said, Dear Mr. Foster, congratulations on your almost marriage. We at CityHorbrides.com would like to commend you on your excellent choice of life partner. Luli is a wonderful cook and can easily be taught your favorite dishes. 
Unfortunately, due to the high cost of travel, we are forced to send her on an installment basis. We assure you that this will not lessen the quality of her work or her health. We wish you all the best on your marital journey. Yours, sikihorbrides.com. Thank you. Oh, no, I don't know whether to laugh or shake in terror, both, I suspect. What a great combination. <laughs> Ready for our fourth reader, Shamiz Patel Papathanasu. Shamiz Patel Papathanasu is a South, South African author working as a civil engineer by day and writing fantasy by night. Her literary adventures take her to worlds filled with magic, monsters, and someone to fall in love with. Her debut novel, The Last Feather, is a threat and danger hidden world fantasy, and today you will be hearing from, I believe, book two. Shamiz, take it away. That's right. Um, hi, I'm Shamiz Basal Papathanesio, and I'll be reading from The Eternal Shadow, which is the second book in the Sinning trilogy. The scene I'm about to read takes place after Cassia Khan is abducted from our world and she's taken to the Selene realm to be the king's personal healer. But as she arrives at the ball he's hosting, she sees Prince Lachlan, the unlikely ally who had helped her save her sister and best friend, Lucas. But he also happens to be the son of the cruelest man. The music danced across her skin and her knees wobbled as she tried to make sense of everything happening around her. The observer, Finn, tugged on her elbow, pulling her toward the center of the hall. The slit in her dress split as she tried to keep up with him, and she was acutely aware of how much skin she was showing. She rarely showed any. When Lachlan came into view, she stumbled, and Finn drew her to her feet. Even so, she didn't care to look at the ground she nearly slammed against. She was lost in his eyes. His bright blue eyes. The ones she'd often dreamed about. And they were wide with a fear that reflected her own. Her magic swirled, fought to get out of her, and the observer let go of her hand and stared down at his reddened palm. What did you do? He asked. She tore her gaze away from Lachlan to frown at the observer. She hadn't done anything. She turned back to Lachlan, catching the muscle in his jaw fluttering as he looked at her and stole a glance at his father. But the king's terrifyingly blue eyes, so similar to Lachlan's and yet entirely different, were also fixed on her. He scanned her from head to toe, his smile slowly growing, a smile nothing like his eldest son, but exactly like the other. Prince Kane gestured, gestured toward her and looked at Lachlan, whose expression had changed to a mask of nonchalance. Kane stood, and while he was tall, he didn't take up much space, but he walked as if he intended to, pushing his way through the crowd of firsts with an unappealing look of determination on his weak face. The guests moved aside. But if they lingered a second too long, he elbowed them out of the way. Cassia waited. The very least she would do was make him come to her. But before Cain could lay his filthy hands on her, Lachlan teleported to her side. He and his brother were both wearing the same black military-style tailcoat with gold button detailing, which matched the embroidery on the maroon vest they wore underneath. The cloak he always wore was draped across his shoulders. He didn't touch her but his eyes seemed to scan her for injuries, meeting her gaze and speaking volumes. Prince Lachlan, he said, lowering his head, and the light scattered off the jewels in his crown. And you are? he asked, as his brother reached them. Her heart fluttered with excitement at the familiarity of someone who knew she wasn't meant to be here, with a fear of what he might do. Cassia Khan, she said, her voice a squeak of what it used to be. Your Highness, she added with a small curtsy. You clean up nicely, the younger of the princes said, his smile twisting something unpleasant in her stomach. Shall we open the floor with a dance? He extended his hand, and Lachlan swatted it away. I'll take the first dance. As the crown prince, it is my right, provided father isn't interested. Lachlan looked over his shoulder to where the king sat. Now, now, boys, our healer isn't here to entertain the two of you. We have other guests for that. He said, his lips tilting upward in something that should be called a smile and yet felt nothing like it. Every party starts with a dance, father, Lachlan said, avoiding her gaze. And I suspect she's your grand finale and you won't be needing her until then. You know me well, boy, 
Cassia's skin crawled at the laid-back tone being used. May I? Lachlan asked, bowing and raising his hand before her. If at that moment she could fit her entire body in the palm of his hand, she would have, and yet she couldn't bring herself to touch him. He lifted his head and laughed lightly. It's either me or my brother over there, fiery little lady, and I have a feeling you'd prefer me. Her breath hitched at the familiar nickname that she'd initially disliked, but now it comforted her. A private message, giving her the boost she needed to rest her hand in his. The second their skin touched, the heat from his hand, hot against her already warm skin, sent a shiver to her very core. I'll lead, he said in a voice so low, it dropped to the bottom of her stomach. All eyes turned to face them as Lachlan led her to the centre of the hall. She'd expected a waltz, but he pulled her against him with what she thought was more force than he intended. Her chest bumped against his. His deep gaze dropped to her cleavage for a second. No necklace, he said to himself, followed by a string of curses. She felt his flaming hand slip to the small of her back, and she reached up to rest her hand on his jacketed shoulder, nervously fiddling with the embellishments. As soon as the band started playing a new song and the music drowned out the noise of the chatter and clinking around them, he whispered, what are you doing here? His face was expressionless. Even though his tone was hard, the smell of vanilla radiating from him made her almost dizzy, wanting to lean into it and be transported to another time, another moment. Stepping along with him, she scowled. Do you think I want to be here? She forced a smile as he spun her around. The first watched them, half interested, drinks in one hand, food in the other. Are you okay? Did they hurt you? No, she whispered, hesitating as she thought of Kane touching her, squeezing her against the wall, his tongue, his roaming hands. A low growl escaped Lachlan as if he'd read her mind. She felt it in the vibration of his chest against hers before he stepped away, elegantly moving to the music in a way she had not expected him to. Nothing I couldn't handle, she added. Pulling her back toward him, he twirled her around until her back met his chest. He lowered his head to her neck, where his hot breath heated up even further. I can't get you home without a feather necklace, but I can take you to Lucas, he whispered in, his ear, in her ear, his lips trailing her skin. She had known that without a necklace, she would be trapped in the Celine realm, but hearing Lachlan say it sent her spiraling. If he hadn't been holding her, she'd have fallen over. Turning around slowly within the smooth beat of the music, he guided her across the dance floor, and as if floating, she moved along with him, their movements in sync as their eyes scanned the surroundings. No, she mouthed, and he pulled her close, giving her a chance to explain herself. If I escape now, they'll kill my family, she said, and the masky wall cracked for a microsecond before it was replaced with a perfectly flawless look of arrogance and pride, reminding her that he was still the king the prince of the first. Perhaps you could warn my family first, move them somewhere, and then come back for me. He spun her out and dipped. The rush of blood to her head made the entire situation seem as though it were happening in her imagination. When he lifted her back up, his mouth lowered to her neck and her head fell back. Her skin prickled pleasantly against his lips and she wondered why her body was reacting to him at a time like this. I'll figure something out, he whispered. And as his mouth reached her ear, he added in a low voice, and I'll kill Kelly for bringing you here. Lachlan's palm trailed her arm as he stepped backwards, creating space between them until his hands joined hers. The music wound down and he raised their joint fingers before bowing deeply at the waist. Cassia glanced over at him, finding him flashing that perfect smile. She curtsied, mimicking his smile, and the audience cheered. Without letting go, he led her back to the dais her heart beating fast, her palms clammy with heat and adrenaline. Her skin, like his, glistened with sweat from the movement from the overly warm room. You're a dancer, the king said as they approached. What a lovely treat. He wet his bottom lip before his face fell into the crooked smile he wore with ease. The long scars left by Rolog stretched across the one side of his face, and Cassia found herself wishing Rolog had finished the job, devoured him entirely. This was the man who abducted children and abused reborns and guests. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I love dances where people are talking about other things. <laughs> so much fun. All right. Our fifth reader is Julie E. Cherneda. 
Award-winning science fiction and fantasy author and editor Julie E. Cherneda was inducted into the CSFFA Hall of Fame in 2022. Hmm. Published by Daw Books, New York, her latest release is a standalone science fiction novel to each this world. Julie is represented by Sarah Megabo, Megabo, Megabo of KT Literary. Julie, I look forward to hearing this. The Planet Doublet. Having checked her creation for any mouths free to nip, Beth wore it over her short cropped hair, soothed by the vines was put complaint, still alive. As long as they were a sweep wouldn't tag either as intruders, safe as starships, Beth murmured. Doublet had a starship, a great halcyon class sleeper ship named the Exeter for a place on earth past and gone. And Beth, like everyone else, took her turn at maturity to stand in the remnant of the hull that had seeded this world with their kind of life. And while standing there, she thought it past time to recycle the metal, the rest having been repurposed and helpful, not that others would agree, being stuck in the past and gone themselves. She shook off the bit of ill feeling, though it was part of why she was a seeker and such a good one, her burning need to go somewhere new and here, to find and learn, to take a piss first while it was safe. She caught every warm drop in the flask, not letting a trace of her touch the ground. There were those below who'd notice. In the split, you rested the heat of day, moved as it eased its start and end and hoarded moisture and strength. By full dark, you hid from what wanted both. Beth placed a stone to gauge the sun's height in the sky and by its shadow, time to go. Taking up her sounding stick of metal mind and doublet, thus free of earth taste, Beth left last night's hidey hole. Her thigh-high boots of, were coated with slick resin and had thickened soles of away rubber. The ground of the spit, split ate through them, and she carried spares in her pack, the limit of her journey there and back again. With each step, Beth struck the ground lightly with the butt of her sounding stick. The tinkling hollow beads inside made her footfalls a message. I'm a seeker. Let me pass. The meaning was human. The result, the crust beneath her feet staying solid, was what counted. They learned something lived below. Something built shelters in a way and left them empty. Same something made the land divided as it was, setting rules that let a body cross, if not easily, then alive. Day would come, they'd meet. Bios ran endless scenarios and talked it out, making plans. A few always argued to slow down, being fearful, but everyone knew they had no choice. Sharing this world, the Exeter brought to a purpose, and it was this. When no one doubted, it'd be a seeker who came first, face to what. Beth had her questions lined up, should it be her, starting with why. Might be. This trip, her pack contained more of what the Bios called meaningful artifacts, junk saying something about what they were in case what wasn't was curious. Those below had yet to show interest, wasn't as if she had a better notion. Other than the junk, her journey be a straight cross to a familiar part of a way, straight so as little time in the split as could be, familiar, a place Beth been before, but no promises in a way it be any sense the same. Life there was fretful. According to the bios, what inhabited the other half of Doublet was at a different evolutionary stage than the tamer life of home, more inclined to bite first. If the junk didn't elicit a response, Beth would keep going. Bios after samples of fungal fruiting bodies, still alive samples, she reminded herself cheerfully, so no need to wear a nippy vine hat on the way home, assuming the response didn't kill her. In space, meanwhile, in orbit around a different world. Oh my God, oh my God. God, she and Giselle must have done a right good bender. Killian hadn't felt this wasted since, Oh, Kameth's talking to you, get up. Kameth, her eyelids cracked open as Killian belatedly realized someone outside her head was shouting, no, booming at her. Help, boom, help, boom. She stared into Kameth's gaping mouth, gagging at the stench. Spittle burned her face and Killian scooted backwards on the floor till she hit the wall. She pushed herself up and out of range. What's wrong, she shouted after the next boom. Danger to the duality. Huge gold brown iris eyes fixed on her, clear lids flashing back and forth. Danger, pilot, Kemet here announced. The spikes on Kemet's head erupting with red willy bits. She didn't need a manual to say meant upset, maybe even fear. Boom, I need your assistance, hurry. Kemet swung around. 
Killian jumped the trailing flipper leg, sprang to the side to avoid Kmeth's tail, and as it scraped the wall where she'd been, then hastened after the creature, searching desperately for a clue to its behavior. Kmeth here better not have broken the portal. Contract or no contract, she had no intention of staying wherever they were, the screen's an ominous blank, for however long it took the pips to fix it, if they could. Boom, help, boom. Coming, what do you want me to do? Fix. Kmeth angled the eye on Killian's side to stare at her, the black lid half down. Humans in wrong place. Did Kmeth want her to leave? Her head hurt, not to mention her stomach, and she'd be very happy to be anywhere else. Still, the booms had to mean something wrong. Kmeth here, where would you like me to be? No, pay attention, fool, Kisho chided, the head in her voice in her head. Kmeth said, humans, plural. The sleeper ship Henderson, that's where you've gone. Their world. It couldn't be. Oh, but it could. That probe, the argument with the arbiter, mind-bending pops between locations that honestly had left Killian shaky on left and right, let alone a conversation. Come at here. Where are we? Here. Three screens activated, showing the same view. Ash drifting down lifeless streets. Seared twists like overdone bacon left on a plate, clustered as if caught together. Killian would have been violently ill if she had anything left. She must have cried out. Maybe Kisho did, seeing what she saw. Did you do this? Did you send Komet there to kill those people? The lid raised, pupil dilating. All Komet here came to protect you. Protect New Earth. Protect humans here. We cannot protect humans there in wrong places. We will bring them home. Help. Retrieve them. Re Killian looked at the screens. Retrieve what? Bring human there to human here, or human here becomes human there. I don't understand. Ask for the arbiter, Keisha's voice trembled. Ask for him now. Killian took a breath, holding her hands at her waist. I'm only a pilot. You need the arbiter for this, Komet here. The arbiter. The Komet uttered a two-tone hum. The red willy bit slowly turned to placid mauve. Agreed. First, retrieve humans there. Kameth heaved himself from the pedestals, granting Killian access. Need pilot for that. She stepped up on the dais, facing the center pedestal, and her hands wanted to shake. She'd no idea what the Kemet wanted her to do. Retrieve, she echoed, trushing Kisho to know. Activate the mining pits. Send them down on the big lifters. Kameth will input the parameters. Kishu went on, reciting a sequence, guiding Killian's fingers as if the old pilot stood here instead. Numb at first, Killian slowly began to anticipate what to input and where. She trained for this, mining with the most common task for a human portal human operator, but never for charred corpses, never for the dead. Nothing like this. There'd never been anything like this. Beautiful reading, Julie. Thank you. I am sure people will want to find out more about these worlds and what's going on. And don't forget, you can find out more. A lot of these books are e being offered as giveaways, so be sure to check that out. All right. Our final reader is J.R. Dawson. J.R. Dawson is a writer and educator with shorter works in places such as fantasy and science fiction, the year's best science fiction and fantasy 2018 and Lightspeed. Living in Omaha with a loving spouse and three dogs, Dawson works with assorted nonprofits that bring performing arts to children in the Midwest. The first bright thing is her first novel. JR, over to you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to read the very beginning of this book. <clears throat> Chapter One, The Ringmaster, 1926. The Spark Circus rolled into town on a Tuesday early in the morning. The well-worn train snuck onto the tracks right outside of town as the birds woke and the dawn broke through the sleepy shadows of trees cloaked in an early mist. Train spotters didn't notice the train's approach until it was nearly upon them, appearing in a blink and charging into town, the cars red and gold and blue with a name written along the side, Windy Van Hooten's Circus of the Fantasticals. 
The last two cars were purple and gold with flowers painted on their thick, sturdy wood siding, the windows laced with red curtains. Today, here in Des Moines, there had been tracks for the train to appear on. On other days in other towns, the train simply arrived in the middle of a field with not a rail yard around for miles, like magic. But no, it was Sparks. The Circus of the Fantasticals worked on upfront deposits, meticulous yet flexible planning, and well-placed advertisements like all circuses. But something more than a seasonal schedule also drove this particular train. The Spark Circus always arrived at the right place at the right time, even if it was just for one person who needed to see their show that night. In a decade where the past was a nightmare and the future was a dream, the present was an unknown sort of way station where everyone seemed a little lost. Some would recall their visit to the Circus of the Fantasticals vividly as a pivot in their lives. Others would simply be inspired to do better or think differently, with no catalyst they could quite put their finger on, but would likely trace back to that one time they went to see the circus. Today, June 8th, 1926, was Des Moines, Iowa's turn. By the time the city awoke, the circus was set up in their rented plot near the tracks. Some townsfolk skipped work and most children ran from chores to watch on the plot's outskirts while the sparks emerged from the train cars to put up the big top and make the midway appear. One spark changed into an animal, another multiplied themselves to get things done faster, while another lifted wagons above their head. The townsfolk might have been slightly afraid, but as the day got older and the posters went up all over town as they watched with growing fascination, they realized this might be their only chance to see something extraordinary, and so they went to the circus. The midway held the youth of smoky July evenings and the feeling of a young body rushing down a very steep hill. Something in the electric string lights hanging above the musical chime of carnival games and candy carts brought back a safe home that everyone seemed to remember but had never been able to find until tonight. There was a squeal and a small stampede of children dragging their mothers to follow them up a little wooden bridge. The bridge led to the sideshow, which was for everyone, not just gentlemen, and it wasn't a cheap exploitation. It may have only been made of plyboard and luminescent paint, but it still held something exciting in the way it invited the audience to run through it, to explore in their own way. Halfway through, giggling children bounced on a rubber bridge with just enough give, and their parents stood in awe inside a tunnel that looked like it spun through outer space. It was technology carved and moved by wooden gears, like something out of George Millier's dreams. But the big top itself, the archetypal main event, was admittedly nothing special. In fact, it looked more beaten down than the other passing circuses the townspeople had said, seen before. The tent was tattered at red and white canvas and muslin, thriftily yet expertly sewn together. The audience seats were only benches on bleachers set in a circle outside rings of flimsy painted sawdust curbs, with areas on the ground level for those who would have trouble climbing up the rickety steps. The floor was dust that was easy to traverse, but still coated boots and wheels and nice Sunday shoes all the same. The lights were too sharp, too few, and seemed mostly to spotlight just how dirty and ramshackle the inside of this big top was. It seemed to resemble a barn more than a theater, held together by spit and glue rather than nails. But that was just the pre-show. When the tent went to blackout, when the audience hushed and the spotlight clicked on, there in the halo of illumination stood the ringmaster, commanding in a bright red velvet coat. The ringmaster looked out to the audience from the center of the large ring, Middle-aged and looking every bit a lioness, the ringmaster had a wild mane of golden brown hair that frizzed in the heat, didn't dry fast enough in the cold, and was somehow always getting in her white face, which was either sunburned with a thousand freckles or as pale as a ghost in winter. She had black eyes, unheard of, 
that either glimmered with possibility or doled with the density of a black hole. Some thought she was beautiful. Some thought she was brash. But it was undeniable that she would take them on an adventure. When she smiled, it seemed to the crowd like she was looking at the world for the first time, as if she had just caught her first glimpse of them, saw the brilliance of their hearts, and had known what great things they'd already done and would do. The smile was a genuine embrace, the first bright thing in this dark, dusty place. Welcome, she said to every single person in the audience. Welcome home. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful image. And I love the idea that it comes for whoever needs it. All right. Thank you so much to everyone who came today.